welcome to the Tetrachy Business Revolutionary Podcast. My name is Rob Yates, performance coach, serial entrepreneur, and CEO of Tetrachy. We're going to bring to you episodes where we interview people who we believe are true business revolutionaries, people who've had success and done it their way. In addition to that, we're going to have episodes where my co-founder, Mark Hopkins, and myself bring you actionable how-to-achieve content. In this episode, I am so excited to bring to you Rick Wong. Rick is an entrepreneur, a consultant, an author of Winning Lifelong Customers with the Five Abilities, and also, Rick was a vice president of Microsoft. In this episode, Rick is going to tell us all about what he believes makes a great salesperson, about his experiences of working with Microsoft founders Bill Gates and Steve Ballmer, and how he developed the five abilities which he believes are the key to your success. Today's episode is brought to you by the Tetrachy Business Revolutionary Club, our free membership club for you, bringing you every two weeks transcripts of these podcasts, groundbreaking webinars, training, coaching, and information, all for free. To join, check the notes in the link below. Come along and join, and join our mission to serve one million people in this club. Now, without further ado, let's break forwards into today's episode and go and truly become business revolutionaries. Hi, welcome everybody to the Business Revolutionary podcast. A special welcome to today's guest, Rick Wong. Um, now, many of you don't know this, but when I decided to build the podcast, I wrote a top 100 people of people I wanted on the list, and then I wrote a top 10 of people I wanted to have another conversation with. <laughs> and, uh, and Rick was in the top 10, so much to my delight when he agreed to spend the time with us today uh, out of his busy schedule. Um, Rick, you and I have got a mutual friend. We've had conversations in the past, and... Um, I'm curious to hear more about who you are, what you do, why you do it, where you've come from. And I'm almost positive that our listeners are feeling exactly the same. Okay. Um, I, I know that you've followed many paths on your journey. Um, sport, music, uh, corporate world. And I wonder just to kick it off, what's the, what's the memory that you've got that um, has brought the most satisfaction to you? Boy, the memory that's brought the most satisfaction. Um, so, so, boy, that's a that's a that's a that's a question I don't guess very. So, uh, the memory that's probably brought the most satisfaction to me is. Um, when well there, there's a lot of them but um what's the one that jumps to mind straight away yeah so getting into mba school mm -hmm. was kind of i i it, you know we all have these these things that happen to us that change the trajectory that we're on mm. and getting into M mba school was one of those for me because uh, you know, you know my story. I, I lost my dad when I was young, and that got me on a bad trajectory. And so I went from a, tra a straight A student to a straight C student at most. Um, didn't think I was ever going to get in college. I did. Uh, and when I decided to give up the music career, uh, I know I, I knew I needed to get on a different trajectory. So I, I applied at MBA school, actually not expecting to get in. <laughs> and uh, but I did. And uh, I think it was three months into MBA school, I got recruited uh, by HP for an internship. Uh, actually, 
everybody in the MBA school applied for that job. Cool. And for whatever reason, I got the job. And uh, I found out, to much, much to my surprise and my wife's surprise, uh, the first paycheck we got, I was so surprised, I was so excited about getting the job. I didn't even know how much they were going to pay me. I didn't care. You must be the first person in history to not care about the paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's something we can talk about later because yeah, that's interesting. It, it's interesting. I uh, I think it's more common than you think. Hmm. Um, because the HP job was kind of one of those jobs everybody in the school wanted. There were like five of them, and HP was one of them. And then I got the first paycheck as an intern. Remember, I'm a student intern. And I was making more than I was making before I started school. What? Yeah. And, and so much so that my wife and I actually bought a house while I was in MBA school. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So, you know, the lights went on and said, hey, there's something to this tech industry. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm sticking around. <laughs> and uh, trading your keyboard for your uh, your guitar for a keyboard how was that uh trading my guitar for a keyboard what do you mean well so i mean uh, before you were uh, a musician i mean i see you were chasing down doors in hollywood and all sorts yeah. of things and then that transition to a, i mean a computer keyboard um oh oh oh, oh i'm sorry i'm sorry that's right. okay it's, it's quite quite a transition yeah it, it was however uh there's a lot of science now out there that says um, there's a lot of connection between music and math mm -hmm. uh, and really it, it's about pattern recognition and so forth turns out math pattern recognition all those kinds of things go well in the tech industry <laughs> and so if you walk around the halls of any tech company you will find a lot of musicians a lot okay and what else was there from that music musical background and sporting background that sort of led you through as as tools or habits successfully in that executive space so i think i i'm one of those people i i really value the time i had in sports um i know you and i have a common thread in that because you've been involved in sports for a long time mm. um i I really promote to any parent who wants to know that I, their kids should get into sports and it doesn't really matter if they're good or not. Uh, it's just, it, it just matters that they learn how to play, learn how to compete. Um, there is a study that Harvard put out a number of, uh, actually probably about two years ago. And they found that um, they, they wanted to profile what makes a successful salesperson. Mm. Because companies all over the world have trouble hiring good salespeople. Uh, well, I'll be right? honest, we do. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and one of the things they found out is of the salespeople who were considered by their company to be ultra successful, I think the number, I think 87% of them played a high school sport of some kind. Wow. And the important part was not that they were good, not that they were a star or whatever, but that they chose to play. And, and so competing became a core of their being, but not only competing, because you know this, when you play team sports, you have to learn how to get along with people you may not disagree with, right? When the play starts, even if you don't agree with the play that was called, it's important that you're on the same page and that you're doing your job. Mm. Um, um, you meet all different kinds of people um, on the field that, that uh, or whatever your, your sport is, yours happens to be water. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you meet all kinds of different people and in the business world, in almost anything you do, uh, one of the key capabilities you, you must have is to be able to work with a diverse set of people, hmm. right? And, and I think sports, as a young kid, I can't think of anything more, anything 
that teaches you that better than sports or some kind of competitive thing. So like I have a friend whose son is a chess champion, but he plays on a chess team for his school mm. and he gets some of the same benefit. I can see that. And does that, is that the same with being a musician and playing in a band or part of a group? It's a very similar behavior set, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. Harmony. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, there are very few of us in the world who are good enough to sit on the stage all by themselves and entertain an audience. <laughs> not very many of us. Uh, certainly I was not one of those. Uh, and, and so you get in a band and yeah, here's the reality. You don't always agree on what music to play. Um, I, we, I played in a band where we did all our own music and we all thought we were writers, right? We all thought that our songs were the best. And, and somewhere along the way, through a combination of listening to our audience, listening to our manager and so forth, we had to pick which ones were the ones that we would uh, record and play and so forth. And when we got up on stage, no matter what we were feeling before we got on stage, we had to put on a show. Completely. You know, um, the, the, the hardest thing being a musician is getting up on stage, playing a song for the hundredth time that year and making it sound like it's the first time you sang it. Wow, that's quite a challenge. That's like repeating the same keynote speech over and over and over again. With exactly. The exactly. And the people who do that well, I have the same skill. Mm. Because yeah. I, find it, I find it interesting that the path you followed through to today, um, I was, in, the, in my notes, I was noticing that you started your MBA when you were 27, 28, 29 years yes. old. Yes, 27. Like um, 27. 27. And it, it strikes me that quite a lot of the people who've done stuff with their life haven't necessarily always followed the traditional 18 to university, 22 to MBA or a master's degree. You know, they, they've, they've done other stuff. And I wonder what you think about that and um, in terms of kids and people getting other experience and, and experimenting. I think in, in the MBA school, that I, I went to the University of Washington Foster School, um, which you may not have heard of, but um, it's the number one MBA school in the Pacific Northwest, probably. And I know it's ranked in the top 100, but I don't know where it is which was another reason it was surprising that I got in. <laughs> um, so uh, with the exception of people who were intending to teach for a living, mm -hmm. so like go right back to the university and teach a business class or whatever, uh, everybody else came in after having anywhere from three to 10 years work experience. And um, I, I, I think that was very important. And the people who, the people who made the decision to, to come to MBA school because through work experience, they had learned, they either seen the end of the road mm -hmm. for the abilities they had or wanted to change, uh, you know, professions or whatever. Uh, those are the ones that I that that thrived after MBA school. Okay. Um, the ones who were just doing it because it was a thing to do um, were so so. And it, it's it's very interesting because um, we've got I don't know if you know this we've got a business revolutionary club membership program and I asked all the <laughs> members I'm interviewing Rick uh, what questions would you like to ask and one of our members asked. Um, how can he best equip his three-year-old son to be <laughs> how to have a like a successful, purposeful, and employable uh, life in? Let's be honest about it. Probably twenty years' time, um, yep. Elon Musk is talking about there being what something like seven million jobs less in twenty-five years' time, um, mm. all that sort of things. And, and and I wonder what your views are on that because I know there's no one answer, but I, I wonder what you think. Yeah, um, we've already talked about sports. I, I think sports was a good thing. It's not the only thing. 
I, I think part of um, parenting, and I, I learned this because I grew up in a poor family, so I had no choice but to be independent, mm. and which meant I was accountable for whatever happened next, no matter how bad the situation was today. And we try to instill that with our kids mm. and uh, which meant, you know, we weren't going to come in and save you every time you had a problem. Um, it, it, it's really important that you learn how to figure these things out yourself. And, and so that's, that's one thing that, that, that we, that re we really had a lot of focus on. Um, you know, when you go from three to a little bit older, mm -hmm. Uh, there were things right or wrong, you know, we, I, I worked in the tech industry. I live in an area where most people work in the tech industry. Um, our kids went to a school where most of the parents were in the tech industry. And uh, if you drove into the parking lot, you'd see a lot of very nice cars that kids were driving. <laughs> and, and we never did that with our kids. And, and they hated us for it at the time. We, I mean, we didn't even get them a car. Um, uh, they took the bus and they hated us for it at the time. And today they're now 28 and 29. And they both come back and said, we're so glad you didn't, you didn't do that to us. Because, you know, they're talking about friends who are living at home, um, who are going from job to job to job and and so forth and and don't really have that sense of earning it and that mm -hmm. sense of accountability mm -hmm. so i don't know that's probably more than you wanted to hear but but th those are things that we we, we did there's some key themes there of problem solving accountability um a, a, almost a work ethic um, yeah being prepared to work for what it is you want as opposed to uh just being given something on a plate yeah um, it's very interesting. And um, when you you left your uh, MBA school and you stepped, as you said, into Hewlett Packard. Um, yep. At quite an interesting time for Hewlett Packard. Uh, there was a whole bunch of stuff going on. What were you doing, and what did you take away from that? What did you, what did you learn? So, I was lucky that I got hired by HP because they were going through a period in the mid 80s where they they decided that what they were doing before well well let me back up hp was just getting into commercial computing so they were very good in on the engineering side so they sold instruments to boeing to build airplanes and and so forth so if you went to any test lab or hospital in the in the country in the world really you would see hp equipment they weren't so good on the commercial side and they were just entering into that. And what they were doing was they were taking engineers mm -hmm. and teaching them how to be business people and be, being able to have the conversation with business people. Right. And um, with as much focus as uh, on, on kind of EQ versus IQ. Mm -hmm. they, they had no shortage of IQ people, but they were finding that training an engineer how to um, have EQ, how to have a business conversation with a business decision maker, all those things they weren't so good at. No. Turns out, uh, science came out that said um, EQ is a skill you develop when you're like six or seven years old. Yes. And, and, and so beyond that, it becomes very hard in a traditional classroom training perspective to train people on it. So they tried to experiment in the mid 80s where let's go hire MBA students or business students or, or whatever and train them how to be engineers. Mm -hmm. And uh, because, you know, we're a technology company, I think we can train people about technology uh, and maybe we do that better than training them how to be salespeople, marketers, what, whatever it be. So I got caught up in that. Uh, so I, I was very lucky because 
Um, in fact, when I got the internship, everybody like everybody in school was, including me, was going, "Why did Rick get that internship? This is HP, you know. All us, uh, all us engineers should have gotten that job." Um, so it turns out they were experimenting and uh, focusing more on the EQ aspect, and it worked out well for them. Not just with me, but they they were doing it with the you know, every place in the world. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, yeah, that's how, that's how I got hired in HP and, and the, the EQ aspect allowed me to succeed there. Um, and it's what led me to develop, we talked about earlier, the five abilities. Yeah, we'll come back to the five abilities in a moment. Um, so something strikes me where you and I've got another uh, shared piece that we're both uh, introverts living in an extrovert's world. Yes. <laughs> and uh, and, and I, I wonder, because um, I end up coaching, we end up working with a lot of people who are introverted, yet they need to sell, they need to market, they need to manage people, they need to have, they need to do podcasts. Um, I, I, I wonder what tricks or tools or things that you've learned for yourself that enable you to operate successfully in that extroverted world so um uh susan kane have you have you read her book uh um uh i think it's called quiet in the world of people who can't stop talking it, it was voted as one of the uh top 10 uh most influential books of the first 10 years of the 21st century mm. uh, so one of the things that's very important, and you know this, when people hear introvert, extrovert, they think uh, introverts are shy, extroverts are not, mm. period. And that's how they decide you're introverted or extrovert. Mm. It turns out, scientifically, that is not the case because you know, you're not a shy person. I'm not a shy person. Mm. Uh, the difference is in how you recharge, how you, um, you know, get yourself back onto your A game. Extroverts get recharged by, by being around people, by party, whatever. Mm. Uh, introverts need that alone time um, to recharge. So it, it's kind of self-reflective. Yep. Uh, it's funny you asked me this because uh, actually my next blog is exactly on this topic. So uh, because I, I get this question all the time in workshops. Awesome. And what I'll do um, in the show notes is I'll put the book title in the show notes and I'll put a link to your blog as well so people can go and, find okay. that and read that as well so they can engage with you. Go on, sorry. Great. No. Um, so uh, the, the thing with being an introvert and extroverted world, it, it, when I first got into the world, I thought, um, you know, this isn't me and that somehow I was gonna have to figure out how to be an extrovert. And you and I both know there are introverts out there that try to fake it all the time, mm. right? And, and the faking part is not the fact that we can have a discussion or that I can walk into a room and discuss things with people. It's how you get recharged, that, that's the thing. Um, you, you tried faking it. Was that part of your learning process? Because I know I have. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. In fact, um, a story uh, th that's in my book. Uh, one, you know, all all my life, I guess I, I I've known I was an introvert. I wasn't the big party guy and and all that because I just needed that alone time. So um, the first job I got out of college when I was still trying to be a musician. Musicians always have a second job. That's, you know, that's guaranteed. Um, or a third job. You've heard the joke about and my the, second, what's, what's the difference between a large pizza and a musician is the large pizza can feed a family. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So <laughs> I, I, that's a good one. So, um, so I, um, uh, I, I, I knew I was an introvert, um, but, but the, the job I first got out of college, 
to kind of subsidize my musician income was selling checks. You know, the things that, you know, there's not much difference between my checks and somebody else's checks. Mm. And so that was the ultimate in selling a commodity and uh, the ultimate. And, and I think learning how to sell, but one of the things we had to do is we had to go to all these banking conferences and uh, each of us was responsible for handing out a minimum of 50 business cards and really a hundred was the goal, but 50 business cards, and introduce yourself to, uh, you know, 50 people, 50 to 100 people. And out of that, get like three to five appointments. And maybe if you're really good, maybe 10 appointments uh, mm-hmm. to go see a president of a bank or, or, or a credit union or whatever. I never, never handed out 50 business cards. Probably I never handed out more than 20 or 25. The reason is because, and you know this, introverts um, aren't really good about walking around a room and and making small talk and all that. What introverts are good at though is listening. Mm -hmm. And and we, we like the process of getting to know people in a deeper way. Part of it is to make ourselves comfortable because if we know somebody more, we'll have a Uh, an easier conversation with them. But the other part is just, it's part of our makeup. Mm -hmm. So I never handed out more than 25 business cards, but I always got the most meetings. (laughs) So your conversion ratio was sky high. (laughs) Yeah. And, and I met, I met, I, I, I learned why hay bales around, which I think I've forgotten, but I learned why hay bales around, um, I learned what it meant to be the runner up to be Miss Oregon mm-hmm. um, and all the responsibilities there. Um, and she happened to be an executive at a bank and we ended up having, getting a meeting. And I found out later that everybody in, on my team had been trying to get a meeting with her for years and never got it. And I did. Um, um, and it just, you know, amazing stuff that, that I, I got to learn. I, I, I met one guy who was an alternate for the Olympic team in swimming. Um, and, uh, and these are all things that um, I found out just because rather than walking around handing out business cards, mm-hmm. I actually wanted to have a conversation. You get to know something. And, and, and that was more conducive to my introverted personality than you know, running around the room, meeting everybody. So that, that's one way. Was that the start of you building the five abilities? Uh, I, th- I think back then, unknowingly it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, unknowingly it was because it, it, if you think about what I was doing in asking people questions about themselves, learning about them um, more than just pitching my stuff, it was about, you know, visibility being seen in the right way at the right time by the right people. It was about earning credibility with mm-hmm. those right people, um, understanding enough about them to know if they were going to be a viable customer or client. Um, the big thing is learning enough about them so that I had the capability to deliver on their personal needs. Mm-hmm. I, I strongly believe you, you've heard me say this. People make business decisions for personal reasons. Correct. And, and I have never found that not to be true. And the bigger the decision, the more personal it is. And we can talk about that later if you want. And then... People, yeah. people buy mostly on emotion as opposed to fact. fact play, in my experience, fact plays a part in something. But how mm-hmm. they feel in the process actually is one of the biggest driving factors in the, the yes, no. Yeah. so i think the facts have to be there Mm. i mean um you know the traditional business metrics like roi and payback and all that stuff i think has to be there um but in today's day and age with the information world and and so forth you know your proposal and your competitors proposal can sound different Mm. 
or, or sorry, can sound the same, mm -hmm. right? Um, especially in the world of technology where everybody is catching up with each other, um, you'll get to a point where everybody is kind of saying the same thing. Yeah. So then how does the decision maker decide who they're going to do business with? And at the end of the day, and I've been told this by more customers than I can count uh, or clients that I can count. It's the people that we want to do business with. Mm -hmm. Period. And which kind of makes sense, right? I mean, you, if you're going to do a long project that has a lot of impact in your company, you want to, uh, you want to be doing business with the people you trust. Well, we all, we all like people who are like us. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and, and that makes, um, it, that makes business so much easier if you can uh, truly appreciate the people around you and actually do business with them. Yeah. Less barriers. I mean, shared values and beliefs, just as one thing. Um, the, the only thing I'd, yeah, the only, sorry to interrupt, the, but the only thing I'd say there is, um, People like us doesn't necessarily mean that they're identically like us, but I, I like us in that they want to get things done. Um, they have high integrity. Um, they they listen to you as much as um, uh, as as we listen to them, so forth, because. I, I know you're the same way. I ended up doing business with, with a very diverse set of people. And I find ways to get along with all of them. And the reason is because I think when you, when you talk about people like us, when, when you dig down and you get to know somebody beyond the surface, we're, we're, we're not as different as we might hear we are, like say in the news. You know, in the news, in the news, we're all different and so different that we can't get along. Um, but I found that just not to be true. I think you're right. Uh, I, I do think you're right. When you get down to the actual basic values, we all want to have a, a successful existence. Yeah. R regardless of who we are, if you're going to have like some top level of that. So just uh, flicking along, because um, I know your time's precious. Uh, 95, you stepped away from Hewlett Packard and into Microsoft. Now, I, I'll have to ask the elephant in the room at this point in time, because I'm pretty sure you've got to work with some people that in Microsoft that most of my listeners have heard of, um, Mr. Gates, the founders. And yeah. um, I, I just wonder how some of those experiences with those people were for you. Um, what can what can we learn from them? Um, maybe what can we avoid to avoid doing if we were to replicate that? <laughs> uh, but but I, I know that's something that uh, the listeners will be really keen to hear about. Yeah, well, everybody's different, and I did. Uh, I, I I I was very again. I was very fortunate, blessed blessed if you could say that. Um, that the jobs I had involved a lot of FaceTime with Bill and Steve. Uh, and other people like Jeff Rakes. I don't know. He used to run the Gates Foundation. Um, Kevin Johnson, who's now CEO of Starbucks, used to be at Microsoft, and I had a lot of time with him. Um, so th the thing I learned that that I think is important to your listeners is that they're people too. You know, <laughs> they they were kids too. They have their own insecurities too and um and it you know even though there are some there are some in leadership positions who want to be treated like the king or queen um but not very many most of them want to just um do business and do business with people that they like hmm. and um and if they're good leaders, I, and, and Bill, Steve, Kevin, uh, Jeff Rakes, they were all good leaders. They, they didn't start the conversation thinking because they were these big, you know, um, celebrities in the industry that they knew more than me. Mm. Uh, and, and the reason they wanted to spend time with me, and this is where I was fortunate, 
I just happened to run businesses that they wanted to know a lot about. <laughs> and, 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 and I'm first to admit, not everybody in Microsoft gets that opportunity. And it's just being in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. And, and so for instance, one of my responsibilities early in my career, I ran um, the alliance. I managed the alliance between Dell and Microsoft, which is a huge alliance because this is when Dell was the largest computer manufacturer in the world. Mm. Um, Bill was good friends with Michael Dell, and Steve became good friends with Michael Dell and and uh, and Dell's president at the time. Uh, and they we we made it a. a a habit of having a summit once a quarter, which meant, you know, at least once a quarter, I had to go brief Bill and Steve on what was going on across the company. Mm. Um, and that, and then that later involved Kevin Johnson, that later involved Jeff Rakes, uh, you know, a lot of people. And, uh, you know, they just wanted to know how it was going. And, and Steve Ballmer in particular, um, he he wanted to know that I knew more about the business than he did. That was important to him. That's a very important metric. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I, I remember we, we were on a plane headed to um, to to Austin, where Dell is, and I had written a briefing document um, about Dell's business and where it was going and how it it aligned with us and how it didn't align with us and what the opportunities were for both of us to do more with each other. Mm. It's funny. I wrote it. We, we had these standard formats that we wrote briefing documents in and instead I wrote it like an article yep. and, and I did it because I did it off of a number of interviews I did with different people, including Michael Dell at, at Dell. And, and I remember my boss was sure that Steve was going to rake me over the coals because I didn't follow the format. And so I handed him the document and, uh, and he and a number of the other execs that were on the plane started reading it. And Steve looks up and he goes, who wrote this? I, I said, I did. And he goes, really? <laughs> I said, yeah, you know, I can write, Steve. And um, um, he, and he, he looked at it and he goes, this is good. And he, and he, and he looked in the back of the air, we were on Steve's plane. He looked in the back of the airplane and he goes, you guys got to read this. And cause there were some other guys on the plane that were just riding along for the, to get someplace. And he goes, you guys got to read this. And um, you know, it was, um, it's not that I didn't, didn't, I, I mean, I had my share of getting yelled at by Steve uh, <laughs> when he didn't like what I was doing, but you know, it, 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 I realized that really what Steve wanted as, as bigger responsibilities he had, <clears throat> you know, he, he recognized he was not the expert in everything mm. and that he needed to continue to learn from his employees. So and I was wondering because you said that you know, Steve and Bill and uh, Jeff, Jeff, yes, uh, Jeff Rakes, yeah, they're, they're all uh, people in and of themselves. They have their own foibles, their own insecurities, um, and yet those guys have built a truly impressive business, um, yeah, like of, of a degree of magnitude that, crikey, if 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 you and I individually only achieved ten percent each, we'd be very happy with ourselves. I mean, we would, uh, yeah. And so what is that, what do you think that little elixir is that separated them as, as different? Um, was it luck or judgment or habit or? Um, I think part of it was um, they, they, they all grew up in different ways with kind of, a, with a need to achieve. Mm -hmm. Um a, uh, just a natural curiosity. All the people I just mentioned, and I could mention umpteen more, uh, they were curious. Uh, if something didn't work today, they knew it could work tomorrow if they just asked enough questions and investigated enough things. And, 
and, and no was not an acceptable answer, even though some every now and then no was the answer, but they they all kind of had this perspective that hey, if we work at it, if we learn more, um, we get out of the box uh, and and stop thinking about the same way we've done it all along. Uh, we're going to find an answer that's going to move us forward. One of one of Bill's very good friends, who unfortunately passed away from from cancer, his name is John Nielsen. He he was the VP um, of the organization that first hired me into Microsoft, and I remember uh, I had I had to interview with him to get the job, and they made they ultimately made me three different offers and none of the jobs were anything close to anything I'd ever done in my life. I, I was coming from HP, which is a hardware company and all their jobs had to do with something about launching software. Like the job I ended up taking was launching windows 95 into our small business community. And he goes, what do you think? And I said, I think you're nuts. I, I'm a hardware guy. Why, 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 why would you give a hardware guy the responsibility of launching Windows 95? You know, I, I don't know, you, you may not be old enough, but Windows 95 was the biggest thing on the planet back then, mm -hmm. it was called Chicago. And, and he goes, well, you know, in Microsoft, we, we, we like to hire people who don't know how we did it before because because we're kind of stuck right now and so we want people on this team who did, don't know how we did it before and that's how I got the job actually because everybody else applying for that job was more qualified than me <laughs> so there's, there's a definite running theme for you here so we've got a musician into surprise MBA place it's, yeah <laughs> uh, transitioning into a surprise HP job into then almost transitioning into a surprise Microsoft job. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That's true. That's, uh, that's and very cool. You know, here's the thing. Who think What's like, that? Very cool to have employers who think like that. Yeah. Very. So I was, I was really interested if we go back a little while ago, you mentioned about how you didn't know what the paycheck looked like from HP. And, yeah. um, and, and then said, well, actually, that's quite common. Um, and, uh, well, that's also quite controversial because I know there's some people out there who will chase the dollar sign. And sure. um, other people, Jeepers, there's businesses I've been involved with for two years and I've still not seen a paycheck. And yet it feels <laughs> really good. It feels really good to be growing the business across eight cities. So I'm kind of interested in it. Yeah. It's motivating. And I wonder what your perspective on that was. So in the process of writing a book, but, but also really in the process of hiring good salespeople and later um, helping my managers and directors and so forth hire good people. Um, I found that the best salespeople I worked with throughout my career, um, of all of them, this is 100% true, not one of them counted uh, counted income as their number one motivator. Mm. So they always had something else that made them love being in sales or marketing or whatever, whether it be serving people. Um, the, you know, the, the best salespeople I know, they are addicted to competition. They are, in fact, I would call it they're addicted to winning. And so they, they love to compete. Um, they, they love developing relationships with different kinds of people mm. and they love to help. Um, so, and you find people with all those three things, you put them in a sales job and they perform on all those three things. And you should, you, you probably would recognize all those things make up a good salesperson, competitive, mm. loves to meet people. Um, loves to help, right? And without exception, those are the people that make the most money. Mm -hmm. But money was not their motivation. It was the other three things. 
And I, I think actually, like, like I heard a, uh, an interview with Bill uh, just the other day. Uh, he was on Ellen DeGeneres. This is just a few days ago, actually. With his wife as well, right? Uh, 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 no, his daughter was on with him. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and Ellen asked him, you know, what motivated him? And he, his answer was he just always loved software. And he said it was a shock to him <clears throat> when they went public and he found out how much people valued the company. <laughs> um, he goes, I never thought that would happen. I just wanted to build software and, uh, and, and make it easy enough for people around the world to use. So it wasn't just, you know, scientists who could use computers. Mm. And um, so, you know, if you talk to Bill and, and if you get to know Bill, I, I, I don't know Bill really well. I know Steve better. But if you talk to Bill, you sit on an airplane with him and you, you, know, you get to know him a little bit, you find out very quickly that, that all the stuff that comes with being one of the richest people in the world, he just doesn't care about. Mm. Um, you know, other than that his, his mother got him big time into philanthropy and, and that's why the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation exists. Mm. That's very cool. <clears throat> we've, we've mentioned your book uh, a bunch of times, Winning Lifelong Customers with the Five Abilities. Um, and it strikes me that uh, your five abilities, your concept, uh, actually comes back uh, from your time in Hewlett Packard, transitioning into Microsoft. And, and I've, I've read the book, and <clears throat> arguably those principles are are more relevant today than almost they were 20 years ago. Um, I think so. And, and, and I wonder, can you just share with our listeners um, a bit more about what they are and, and maybe what our listeners should be focusing on if they want to up their game? Um, I mean, ultimately, they should go and buy your book and read it. So, I mean, that would, be a, <laughs> that, 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 that would be a win. But if you could give a, a three or four minute, like, heads up as to, well, what are these five abilities and... and how can we leverage on them to do better in business, life, sales, whatever it might be? Sure. So it's pretty common in any business, certainly in the technology business, we, 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 we tend to make things more complicated than they really need to be. Uh, this is another thing that I learned from uh, Steve Ballmer and Bill Gates, Kevin Johnson in particular, the guy who runs Starbucks, mm -hmm. he was big into this. Typically, very, very hard problems break down into a simple solution. In sales, what I've learned over the many years that I've done it, you know, all, over 30 years, actually, there, there, people make business decisions for personal reasons, and those personal reasons really break down to only five things. And, and if you can get good at understanding those five things, um, they're going to pick you over somebody else. And the five things, I, I think I told you the story, you've read the book. Um, uh, I was asked to give a win report on a, um, on a, on a big win that we had at HP, HP. I had a big 35 page slide deck. My vice president said, no, I want something clever and catchy and short that that everybody can remember right because i need them to go do it and that that's what became the five abilities so you know those five things that i think uh sales people have to do well i call the five abilities number one visibility you have to be seen in the right way at the right time by the right people very simple concept doesn't mean it's really easy to do but if you can break it down to here's what I'm trying to get done, it's much easier to think about what to do. Mm. Uh, credibility. So visibility, credibility, viability, capability, reliability. Capability is number two. Or cre sorry, credibility is number two. Uh, demonstrate, educate, advocate. You have to be able to demonstrate that you can actually make your value proposition come true. You have to demonstrate that your product works. You have to demonstrate how it's worked for other people. Uh, you have to be in a position of being able to educate your customer. Um, 
so that you become that trusted advisor. Mm -hmm. Beyond just the person selling the product, you have to be able to educate people so that you are the expert. And then advocate, none of us have all the ability necessary to deliver everything to a customer. So we have to advocate for them out in the industry and find other, other solutions to problems they have. In turn, they will advocate for us. Mm. Okay, so it's two-way street. Um, viability. The only thing worse than, winning, than, than not winning a customer is winning the wrong customer. And uh, you probably experienced that, but the wrong customer, very expensive to support. They never become your advocate. Mm -hmm. um, they'll take way more time than the, a customer who is satisfied. And all the benefits that you hope to get, you probably won't get. So in order to make sure you have the right customer, you need to make sure they have a need. And if they don't have a need, you have to have, help them get it. And need includes urgency. Mm -hmm. You need to make sure they have the experience necessary to evaluate what it is that you're selling. If they don't know what success is, then you're going to be like a squirrel on a, on a treadmill, right? Um, they need to have uh, some kind of success history, both personally and as a corporation, um, so that you know that they have the ability to, to pay you, uh, that the individual you're working with has the ability to remove barriers for you, and so forth. And biggest thing, the biggest reason projects fail is they don't give it enough time. And we have an example of that in Seattle right now. It's called the Seattle Tunnel. Um, that was supposed to be done. Do you know about this? Yeah. It was supposed to be done in the summer of 2015, and it's still not open. Mm -hmm. So you do the math. And then capability. There are different personality traits that we all run on and, and that we that, – that, leads us to make decisions. Um, it's uh, some of us look for safety. Some of us look for simplicity. Uh, some of us look for reward. Some of us just want recognition. Uh, some of us want to be the revolutionary. We want to change the world. Uh, but each one of those personalities makes decisions for different reasons. It's up to us to find out which one of those is, which one of those our customer is or client and help them get that. That this is about helping them personally win, right? Mm -hmm. And then reliability, simply put, be there when the unexpected happens. Don't disappear. Because especially in the industry I'm in and in the technology industry, but I think this applies everywhere. The unexpected will always happen. One, always. One two. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and the people that are seen as reliable are the ones who show up and say, I'm going to take accountability for what happens next. Doesn't mean that I cause the problem, but I'm going to take accountability for helping you to success. I call it unreasonable accountability. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so those, those are the five abilities, and, and there's more detail in the book. Cool. And um, for people to get hold of your book, is Amazon the best place or your website? Yeah, Amazon's the best place. And it's called uh, Winning Lifelong Customers with the Five Abilities. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So I'll pop that in the show notes. Um, okay. We're coming towards the end of our time together. And we okay. have a few questions that we ask everybody. Um, <laughs> and so these are pretty short and sharp, pretty off the okay. um, And so here we go. So what is the one question you wish people asked you more often? Uh... Wow. Uh, I don't know if I have an answer. Ah. Uh, um, probably, uh, well, I'll tell you what, and you know this because you read my book. What was your best sale? Mm -hmm. And, um, because I, the very last chapter in my book, my best sale was was getting my wife to go out with me. <laughs> you and me together, brother. <laughs> 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 
Awesome. Okay, cool. So next one. Um, uh, it, it's 50 years from today. And um, uh, the, the time of our, of, our, of our life is coming to an end. What would be the things that you'd most like people to remember you by? That I helped them. Uh, that I had high integrity. That I was somebody they could trust no matter what. Um, and that, uh, I did so without any expectation that I was getting anything in return. Awesome. Awesome. I think I might like that for mine as well, actually. Um, and, and <laughs> here we go for the, the last one. Um, if a, your child or a loved one asked you for the most important lesson, what would it be? Accountability. Um, we are responsible for how we feel, how we move forward, no matter what happens. I, I, I probably learned that early in life when my, when my dad passed away and I had a, uh, social studies teacher who slapped me upside the head back in those days they could physically do that <laughs> and she and she said mister you have so much uh so much opportunity in your life so much aptitude but nobody's gonna do it for you mm. and and really that that and a few other things in my life kind of change the way I view life. I, 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 no matter what problem I have, it's my job to figure out what I do next. My best friend, he wakes up every morning, no matter what's going on in his life, every day is a positive experience. He wakes up with a bright outlook on life. And, and luckily I met him in college. He was my roommate. Um, by chance, we didn't pick each other. Hmm. And I, I learned, you know, you could wake up every morning and think the world, the sun is up. How great is that? What a concept. <laughs> yeah. And so being accountable for your own, your own path, I think is a big thing. Awesome. Um, Rick, thank you very much for spending time with us on the podcast today. Um, your morning, my evening. Um, lastly, where can people <laughs> reach you um, if they want to find out more about you, engage with you? Um, maybe use you for some project work? Whereabouts is the best place they can find you? So Rick, R-I-C-K dot Wong, W-O-N-G, at the five abilities, all one word, dot com. So Rick dot Wong at the five abilities dot com. Or you can just go to my website at uh, www.thefiveabilities.com. Cool. And, and all we have to do is apologize in, in advance in case your inbox gets very full very quickly. Um. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time today, Rick. I know your time is valuable um, and our audience will love to listen to this session. Cheers. So there you have it, the amazing Rick Wong. What a great series of insights, uh, information and thoughts with regards to what it is that you can do to copy the world's elites and possibly adopt the five abilities for yourself. I'd encourage you all to engage with Rick and lastly a massive thank you again to Rick for his time. Um, certainly a conversation that I will be pursuing and I do hope we get to bring Rick back to be a guest for a second time on the podcast in the future. Please share this podcast on all of your social media platforms. In particular, take a screenshot and stick it on Instagram, where you'll find us at underscore Tetrakey. Lastly, this podcast is brought to you by the Tetrakey Business Revolutionary Club. We'd ask you to go join. It's free. Um, go and check the link beneath and we look forward to seeing you inside of the members area where we can continue to give you high quality, great information about how you can go and explode your business and do it in a way that most people will never ever achieve the outcomes that you will. Thanks for joining us today. We look forward to spending time with you in the next podcast and um, if you have any further questions for Rick please go and engage with him on LinkedIn, Facebook or via his website. 
Stay amazing, stay revolutionary. It's been a pleasure to serve you.